This time we look at five 80s muscle bikes. In the late 70s and early 80s, the Japanese manufacturers in particular became obsessed with building bigger and bigger motorcycles. Engines got bigger, power got bigger. Unfortunately, to a large extent, the chassis didn't really keep up with the advances in engine technology. What we got was something akin to an American muscle car, something I like to call a muscle bike. And so here are five great 80s muscle bikes. The Suzuki GSX 1100 Katana. At the start of the 80s, Suzuki formally employed the Target Design Team and its leader Hans Muff to freshen up the designs of the slightly staid looking machines. The team had previously worked at BMW designing machines such as the R65S. The first design was the ED1. This unfair design featured a deeply sculptured seat and a very high and stylish fuel tank. This gave the bike its characteristic sit-in rather than on feel. The ED1 design would see production in the forms of the GS550 and GS650 Katanas. The next design, the much more radical ED2, featured that shark-like fairing. The team had previously used a similar design in the Prover concept for MP Augusta, and of course also resembled the bikini fairing from BMW's R65S model. And in this final form, the Katana would feature Suzuki's all-new 16-valve motors, in 750, 1000 and of course 1100 capacities. With its calf racer riding position, the Katana 1100 had a tested top speed of 147 miles an hour, some 6 miles an hour quicker than the standard, more upright model. And so radical was the styling at the time that many journalists thought that it would not sell. But in fact the Suzuki Katana was a sell success. Although definitely not the lightest bike featured here, it still weighed 243 kilos wet. But fortunately, that big air-cooled 16-valve motor kicked out a very impressive, for the time, 111 horsepower. This was then fed to a 5-speed gearbox to the back wheel. But that old-school chassis did a reasonable job of coping with the power. Although, of course, the radical riding position meant you had very narrow bars, so there wasn't a lot of turning force available to the rider. So riding this thing at speed was hard work and uncomfortable at the same time. Good news for shorter riders, though, because that concave seat lowered the seat height down to just 775 millimetres, which seems incredibly low when you consider how tall they are on modern sports bikes. And handily, the machine is also fitted with a 22 litre fuel tank, which sort of makes a mockery of the new reworked version with its 12 litre job. So on this bike, you could rest assured that your wrists would go out long before the gas tank ran out of petrol. The Katana's radical styling didn't appeal to everybody. But for those who did like it, and I count myself as one, there's really nothing quite like it. And this machine has developed something of a cult following over the years. Sales of the Katana would remain strong for its production run, Marmite styling or not. But as George Harrison once said, all things must pass. And in 1985, the replacement finally emerged, and this of course was the GSXR 1100, and that was a very different and very much more radical machine, and definitely one for another video. Yamaha XS1100 So Yamaha, it's coming to the end of the 70s, you developed the XS750 triple, followed by the XS850 triple, which was, I have to say, a big improvement, but still nobody's that interested, for whatever reason. So what's the answer? Stick another cylinder on the end, and make it a really big bike instead. Well, of course it's more complicated than that, but that's essentially what Yamaha did to create the XS1100. Often referred to as the XS11, the bike first made its appearance in 1978. It arrived with disc brakes all round and shaft drive. 79 would see an American type factory custom model for the US market obviously. And despite its obvious size and bulk, the machine is said to have pretty good road manners by the standards of the time, although the ergonomics could have been better. The European market models featured, of course, lower bars. This helped with ergonomics, 
and with feel also. The bike also featured a 6.3 gallon tank. Because the biggest Jap 4 in production was a big, heavy and above all very thirsty beast. It did make a great tour though, but with a wet weight of 258 kilos, the XS11 was never going to be nimble. Although amazingly it was campaigned with some success in Australia in their Superbike series in 1981. The XS11 was Yamaha's first big capacity four-cylinder bike and was of course derived from those earlier triples, carryovers with that five-speed gearbox with shaft drive, all of which was bolted to that massive engine which produced around 95 horsepower. This doesn't seem an awful lot by modern standards but of course it was an incredibly torquey beast. The engine produces power from way down and so would feel massively powerful to anybody used to a 95 horsepower 600cc machine of today. Not surprisingly, the riders of the day did not consider the XS11 a night to sports machine in the way that a Katana or maybe a CBX1000 is. It was seen much more as a muscle bike come tourer. But this 129 miles an hour behemoth was very much a bike of its day. In 1981, it was discontinued. Kawasaki Z13 So your Kawasaki, in the early 70s you had completely trumped Honda's CB750 by producing a much more impressive machine in the form of the Z1. So along come Honda and fight back with their 6 cylinder CBX model, what do you do? Well, you one up them again with the Z13 or KZ13 if in American. The Z13 is the ultimate embodiment of the muscle bike. It's too big for its own good, it's too powerful and it completely outperforms its mega chassis. No wonder then that the machine has a massive cult following. Kawasaki Z13 arrived in 1979 and in every way it completely one-upped Honda's CBX1000. It ran a six-cylinder engine but this time it was water-cooled and of a massive 1300 cc's. In an effort to keep the engine narrow they designed the engine with an oversquare or long stroke configuration. Kawasaki claimed a then very impressive 120 horsepower, and of course, engine torque was mountainous. And it needed to be, because it was pushing along a lot of weight. The machine had a wet weight of 322 kilos, that's 709 pounds. And this underlies the major shortcoming of these massive bikes. The standard quarter mile time was a massively impressive 11.9 seconds. You have to remember that more than a decade earlier, Norton's Commando had managed the same in just 1.1 of a second slower, with a fraction of the power, and problematically of course, a fraction of the weight. On the road, not surprisingly, this massive machine was a bit of a handful, particularly if you filled up that 27 litre fuel tank. But on the bright side, this was definitely a bike that was going to get you noticed. And the great thing is actually fuel consumption wasn't too bad at all, so that big fuel tank would carry you an awful long way. On the downside of course you couldn't really make use of the massive top speed because it was a sit bolt upright bike and in its early forms had no sort of screen or fairing at all. Not surprisingly this monster machine was fairly expensive, but despite this the bike was surprisingly long lived, remaining on sale until 1989, making it by far the longest lived of all these Japanese muscle bikes. The Honda CBX 1000. The CBX 1000 is very much a case of Honda doing just like they did with the later RVF 750 and producing a bike simply because it could. Because somewhat amazingly, this is a bike whose design began life as a 250 Grand Prix bike of the mid 60s. Honda developed the bike in the late 70s to replace its CB750 on top of its motorcycle tree. The machine had that incredibly impressive 1047cc 105 brake horsepower 6 cylinder air cooled motor, direct overhead cams and 24 valves. Although of course Shakira Honda himself was not best pleased when his groundbreaking 6 cylinder bike wasn't actually the first 6 cylinder production, Benelli Sei beating him to the punch a year earlier. <laughs> 
but of course the Honda was much more advanced. It used the engine as a stressed member in the frame, in that, for those classic fans out there, pant for manner. And although wide, Honda had done a good job keeping the machine down to a reasonable level, so it wasn't actually that much wider than a typical four-cylinder bike. Although it was heavier, of course, tipping the scales at 270 kilos, wet. But performance was impressive, the machine could top 140 miles an hour, and fuel consumption wasn't too bad either. And even better, the chassis actually worked pretty well too, so whilst it looked massive, it cornered surprisingly well. But of course the machine was very expensive, so sales were always going to be somewhat limited, especially when Honda released their CB900F the following year. This machine outsold the CBX by more than 2 to 1, and offered very similar performance, in a much simpler, lighter and more straightforward package. So in 81 they redefined the bike as a sports tourer, offering a vast and very effective fairing, and a mildly detuned engine. But that then was the end of the line for the CBX, and it was discontinued in 82. But if you like your bikes to sound like Formula 1 cars, this is the bike for you. The La Verda 1200 Triple. The story goes that essentially Mr. La Verda is very tall, and Mr. La Verda wants a bike he can fit on. Thus we get the La Verda 1000cc series, a series of bikes designed for people who are pretty tall. At a stroke, given as the first muscle bike. Now as always seemed to be the pattern of La Verda, it was a foreign importer that actually pushed the company into producing something more sporty or more interesting. In this case it was the Austrian importer Werner Sulzbacher. He'd had some success in endurance racing with a bored out 1172cc version of the massive triple and he pushed the company to produce a 1200 production version of their own. The first model of 1200T arrived in 1977. It was based on the 3CL, but the engine bored out in fact to 1116 cc's. This was done by increasing the bore only, the stroke itself was not increased at all. For the US market this was developed into the 1200 Jota. The 1200 engine could be more softly tuned and give good power, but remained clean and running. Also the gear change was moved to the left hand side for these models, with a crossover linkage which ran behind the brake master cylinder. And in the UK the Slater brothers, who of course had developed the original Jota, came up with the Mirage. This used a 1200 engine with 4C cams and a Jota exhaust. It also had partially enclosed bodywork to give the machine a very different look. In standard trim this 225 kilo bike produced a fairly modest 73 horsepower, although of course this rose sharply in the Mirage models. Unfortunately, Laverdes were big and above all expensive, so production of the three cylinder 1200 would end in 1982. Whatever collections of bike would you like to see us feature in our videos? Maybe you own a bike you'd like to see us test ride? Either way, drop us a line. Do you hope you enjoyed that video? If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe, and of course, Thank you very much for watching.